Hello, everyone. Our guest for today is Dr. Shambhavi Naik, the co-founder of CloudCrate, a young and dynamic startup that provides leading Indian distributors of life science products, a user-friendly platform to bring their catalogs, life pricing, latest sales offers to their customers. She also has a postgraduate degree in public policy from Takshashila Institution. I'm glad that I met Shambhavi when she joined NCBS and got to learn a lot from her. She not only helped me in applying for PhD positions abroad, but also her experiences in research and in personal life living abroad simply prepared me for my future endeavors in science. And her claim, uh, her calm and chill attitude and uncommon journey in science keeps fascinating me. Also, she is a fun friend to be around with. So we are highly excited dis to discuss with Shambhavi on how her career progressed to the stages what her views are regarding science and entrepreneurship in India, and what her advice is to the aspiring young fellows who would like to follow a similar career in India. Welcome, Shambhui. And with this, I'll hand over to Manali. Thank you, Madalika, and thank you, Shambhui, for joining us. Um, please tell us a bit more about your background in science. So first of all, thank you, uh, Madhu. Thank you, Mansi and Atul, for inviting me for this talk today. Uh, it's, it's actually quite nice because um, today we are still in lockdown uh, and so it's nice to see other faces uh, than just the family around. Uh, so for my background in science, um, I did my bachelor's from Aruya College in Mumbai. Uh, did a BSc in biochemistry, then went to the UK, did a master's and a PhD both uh, around uh, working around breast cancer. Um, I did a year's postdoc there and then I moved to NCBS here in Bangalore. Uh, under the lab of Apurva Sari. Uh, with Apurva, we moved to Winston, and then it was in 2013 that I, 2016 that I decided to move away from wet lab research. Uh, so about nine years of actually being in the lab, uh, mainly focused on trying to figure out better ways of killing breast cancer cells in a petri dish. Sounds good. Um, so as you mentioned, after you finished your bachelor's in India, you moved to uh, University of Leicester in England for your master's. Um, mm -hmm. Why did you decide to pursue a master's and then PhD abroad? So I always wanted to do cancer biology. I lost my grandmother to cancer when I was eight. And from then on, it was in my head that this is, you know, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to cure cancer. That's, that was mission in life. Um, and I wanted to get to that mission as quickly as possible. Uh, so uh, at the bachelor's levels, I, I did not think that there was a bachelor in cancer biology that I could do. Uh, but the moment I finished my BSc, I thought, okay, well, let me look at MSc options where I could actually explore uh, learning cancer. Um, and Leicester was one of the very few universities back then, this was 2005, 2006, uh, that actually offered a course specializing in cancer biology. Um, and so I applied there. They had actually come to uh, Mumbai for some trade fair or something like that. I remember going and talking to representatives there. Um, and then the moment I saw that there was cancer biology, I was like, I'm going to apply and go. Uh, so that's how I went for my master's. And I subsequently stayed in the same lab uh, where I did my master's uh, project uh, to do a PhD. So it, from there on, it was kind of a, in an auto flight mode. Okay, I see. Um, how easy was the process of applying for uh, the master's degree in England? And did you receive any help from advisors or friends during this process? Right, so um, the, the people that met at the trade fair themselves were very useful. Uh, they had come from the admin office uh, and they had actually collected my transcripts there itself uh, and taken them. So I received an offer letter from uh, Leicester University pretty uh, easily. Uh, it was obviously a conditional one depending on IELTS and other exams. Uh, but the, the conditions were pretty simple. This was again many, many years ago uh, when going abroad was still much easier than it is today. Uh, so uh, getting into the UK for doing a master's program was not that easy. I have to go thank my father uh, because he paid that huge amount of money that uh, I had to go into my master's program. Uh, so uh, yeah, get the, the paperwork wasn't that difficult. Uh, but yeah, I think it is 50 years of my father's work that was spent in a year's time. Uh, so that hardship was borne by him less than this by me. Right. Um, how did you, just a follow up to that, um, mm -hmm. how did you get to know about the career fair, let's say like while you were doing your bachelor's? 
oh through a newspaper i think the ad had come in the newspaper my mother had spotted it so everyone in my family knew that if there was anything closely remotely related to cancer biology i had to be told uh, so the minute my mother spotted the ad she was like chamma there is something happening this there is some cancer what you are going to find out so that's how i ended up going there um and then there was a there was an agency as well involved from from india said whose name i cannot remember now uh, but they kind of facilitated the uh, the application process uh after people work for visa and all of that yeah okay um so now we will switch gears a bit to discuss about your transition back to india so after mm-hmm. finishing your phd in uh, uk you moved back to india to join the national center for biological sciences that is mm-hmm. ncps as a postdoctoral fellow um when did you start thinking of moving back and what inspired you for making the decision so i actually started thinking of moving back even before i left india uh, after my masters uh, i actually thought of coming back and doing a phd in india as well um i had a few months of break while the university that i was working at at lester uh, had to figure out a scholarship and uh, some at least some remuneration for me to be able to survive uh, during my phd because uh, in the uk it is very difficult for international students to get scholarships so i had a few months of Uh, again paperwork that had to go through so i was back in mumbai and i actually went to a lot of uh, institutes around india saying hello okay, i want to go pc here mm-hmm. um and i was told don't run your life go back uh, my main motivation of coming back to india was because uh, i want to work on cancer uh, and cancer the work on cancer requires patience uh, and where else am i going to find patients than here mm-hmm. um during my phd i actually worked with breast cancer patients uh, but over 3 years i got about 16 patients that i could use in my study uh, which is not really a good amount of samples at all uh, and so i felt that being being in india was a very practical decision for me because i thought it would help uh, me get samples but it would also help the indian population with studies that are relevant to them so i always wanted to come back um it was just that after my phd uh, when i was working as a postdoc at the mrc which is the medical research council's uh, toxicology unit in leicester uh, mrc was celebrating its uh, centenary year and they were offering all of their postdocs there was a competition for their postdocs uh, to get 6 months of 6 months to a year worth of funding to go anywhere in the world and work uh, which was under this grant that i applied to come to ncvs uh so that made the transition fairly simple so i basically wrote to apurva and said that i can write for this grant i can come and continue my work here in all lab would that be okay she said yes we wrote a proposal and that's how i ended up in apurva's lab so at friends who went to harvard at friends who went to europe um and i decided to use the one to come there that's great so you basically had a um like had an opportunity to already mm-hmm. like kind of make that transition so i yeah. guess then you didn't apply for any other uh, postdoc positions or any fellowship no or- so it was uh, it was a little time constrained move uh, so mrc told us and we had to kind of uh, write the application in like 10 days so and i i did not know any labs in india at that point of time so i had to do a rough checklist of where i want to be where i could possibly go and continue what i was doing at mrc so that's how i hit upon apurva to a common friend and right and you mentioned something about a grant you had to write uh, or like a grant uh, proposal you had to write for this um application process um so how uh, how did you get the ideas or how easy or difficult was that so this particular grant proposal was actually fairly simple uh, you had to write about how uh, the the place you wanted to move to mm-hmm. would help you extend your work in a new dimension Uh, so you could have done this work sitting in your lab where you were, but now you're going to add some more perspective. Uh, so uh, that was fairly simple. The science of it was fairly simple to write. I was working on uh, death in breast cancer cells, and Apurva's lab was working on not signaling. And so I just made a connection between those two and spoke about how much might actually impact death. Then it was a very simple proposal. I've written. So after I moved here, uh, I've applied to a couple of fellowships. uh post of fellowship to continue my engagement with the progress that those who were obviously much more comprehensive proposals okay could you tell us a bit more about this uh fellowship and uh, uh proposals that you applied for while uh, you were in india in so i applied for uh, one the dsc uh, ra 
uh, which is the research associate fellowship uh, that comes out um, and one more from sir uh, both of them entered doing some bits of experiment which i could do with the money that i got from mrc so the three six months that i spent in nepur was that piece was done um those were quite rigorous proposals uh, i think the serve one we eventually got but by then i had actually left the lab uh, the the uh, the dbt ra one i don't yeah, i did not get uh, i was in a very weird situation by this point of time so um, uh, for uh, multiple reasons none of my papers from my phd have yet been published uh, so from my postdoc i had one paper that i got in within the year of moving to upper was that uh but papers are obviously necessary for you to get grants uh so i actually struggled for a while to get grants because of mm-hmm. i see um so we all know how critical a mentor's role is in shaping someone's future uh, did you have any mentor in india or back in uk uh, who helped you during this transition or during your postdoctoral uh, research i think apurva was a great mentor to uh, start with so I was a professional mentor here uh, at the university years um, he kind of let me figure out a lot of the other things that i eventually ended up doing uh, gave me the opportunity to do that in addition to my science um, the other person is sunil lakshman also at instem uh, sunil joined instem after i joined as a professor and i helped him set up his lab uh, but he he actually helped me understand my strengths uh, and my weaknesses better um uh, in the uk my uh, i had uh, marion and jerry who were my uh, phd supervisors um who then i mean marion was great in terms of she has actually helped when i first moved to the uk she has carried mattresses for me when i was going to set up my own thing uh, it kind of opened my eyes you know to the kind of respect i wanted to give a supervisor and the kind of relationship i wanted to have with a mentor uh with the with openness that i could speak with her about uh, about issues Uh, so in that way she was amazing um and jerry was my like co supervisor uh, but he always he had this habit of uh, sneaking up on to people uh, so he always <laughs> kept me on my toes because yeah. you could just never hear him come uh, and he would just turn <laughs> up there so uh, so i learned i learned quite a lot from all of these sets of people uh, mm-hmm. around me but i think i learned the most from my friends so uh, in the uk like for example i had uh, michelle who was like a senior postdoc mm-hmm. uh, so she was not the pi uh, but she was like a permanent postdoc in the lab uh, and for any problem you could go to her anything in the lab so maybe lab management maybe your science you could go to her uh, and she is still a great friend so there are people who have played their roles in guiding me to where i am um so as a follow up to the mentoring question um do you think an organization like sirai can be instrumental in this process of transition yes i think a lot of um, so when you when you think about mentors you somehow end up thinking of really senior people as mentors uh and what i have seen is that the senior folks are kind of out of touch from reality uh to a certain extent so information like um, i had not realized till i came to ncbs that ncbs does not hire its own postdocs as faculty members right uh, it was it has somehow escaped every everybody's i had that someone could tell me that no one was obviously thinking that i at as a postdoc i was thinking ha I, i want to find the best place i want to do a postdoc in and hey it's ncbs because obviously it's ncbs uh and then i come here and then i realize hey if i want to become a faculty where do i want to go and obviously the answer is the best place and that's when i realized oh i can't do it in the best place because i'm already in it uh that's the kind of information i think uh, uh places organizations like yours can help right gain can help where people can have these informal conversations and say that okay what do you really want to do in life it's not just the next two years of decisions that matters it is the next five next 10 in the long term what do you want to do uh, and what what would be the decisions that help guide you get there how uh, do you think there are any other factors that this organizations like sirai should focus on that would help in this transition uh are you asking purely from an academic point of view or um or? for both like for academia or like you know even for a non traditional career like something that this organizations like sirai can do to help in the transition yes yeah, so i think um, 
definitely in the non traditional uh, setup and i think this is applicable also to the traditional setup in the field is in india things work on networks everything works on networks and i think uh, organizations like such as i i can really help build those networks even when people are in are still in the us right because all of you have come from india uh, so all of you know lab members here pi is here who can actually help give you information that you need uh, typically what we what i've seen in the non traditional uh, setup at least uh, is that there are no official um, advertised job roles india has very few postdocs to begin with so uh, the idea that these postdocs or phd students can go to something non academic is is extremely new right so no one is out there looking to hire like a science policy expert you will not find that in nokri.org um, i managed to get a job because i went to takshashila on my own and said hey i want to try this out mm-hmm. we are now waking up to the fact that phd students and postdocs can do more than just science um, and i think that's where organizations like yours can market yourself and say that look these are the skills that we can apply in your scenarios we can actually help you do your job better as well we bring something completely novel to the table um, and creating those kind of conversations and those kind of uh, networks uh, those kind of job opportunities i think is something that you can proactively do friend who was performing research in a lab in india um compared to a lab uh, back in lister Oh, NCBS was completely new for me. Uh, so uh, I obviously walked in through NCBS gate and I was like, "Wow, this is awesome!" Uh, but there are two things that struck me very early on. Uh, one, and obviously that has nothing to do with NCBS itself, is the supply problem for uh, reagents. Uh, it's just that when I was in the UK, I used to order something from Sigma. It would come in a day, maybe two days at the max. Uh, here, it will take at least two weeks for something to turn up, uh, and accounting for that. was a little difficult uh the second was uh, there were no postdocs uh so uh, in in the uk which is postdoc heavy uh, as compared to that india was phd student heavy and everything was driven by phd students students were doing all the admin work as well whereas in the uk uh, it was a postdocs who were running the lab and managing supplies and doing all of the grant writing and stuff like that that those two for me were really big factors of change because i had come thinking that okay i am going to try and use this role to see if i want to do a um, more faculty at some point of time uh, but it took me a year to try and figure out the other stuff that i had to learn to be a faculty right so i was in allowed so managing inventory and stuff it, it took a while for stuff to move on from the phd students to me uh, so those were two really big things the other thing i found very weird about uh, in in institutions is that uh they have like this they have one cancer lab uh they will have one fly lab uh they will have uh, one skin epithelial cell lab one yeast lab like that uh whereas uh, when i was in the in lester obviously with the university mrc uh the medical uh, research and all there were so many cancer people so i could always go and go into some other lab and talk to them about issues that i faced about for all the agents etc here we don't seem to have that at all Yeah, it's like one lab, and then they're like, "Okay, we have this process for the person, so we don't want to hire anybody else." It's yeah, I'm not yet identified with that hiring team. So okay, so you already told us about some challenges that you were facing while moving back. Uh, so do you think are there any clear advantages between the ways research is being done in the two countries? The way research is being done. Uh, mm-hmm. So here, I think. i mean i moved back with the idea that i wanted to get more patients that actually did not happen because uh, there were a lot of bureaucratic challenges uh, but i think labs which do uh, work which already have those cleared and work with patients you get a lot of samples uh, so that way it is great um india for me is a place of unlimited opportunity there is so much to research uh, and i don't think we are doing enough Uh, partly because we are not funded very well to do the kind of research that we need to do, uh, but it is just I just I just feel that we are we are very undertapped in our potential. Uh, there is literally so much we can do, uh, and I think if I if my UK lab funding was in India, I think it would have just been amazing. <laughs> we have so much talent. 
Sorry, Adil, I missed it. That's like a dream for every one of us. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you did mention about this a little bit that uh, the dearth of postdocs in India, right? Mm -hmm. And you did write an article for India Bioscience a while ago uh, called The Curious Case of the Indian Postdoc. Um, can you give us a brief synopsis and then um, like the factors that triggered you to write the blog? Right, so um, this was in 2015, um, um, my friend Megha, who was a colleague at NCBS, and I decided to uh, host a small postdoc meeting uh, at NCBS, known as the, the first postdoc symposium. Uh, we decided to get uh, postdocs from ISC, JNCSR, Bangalore University, and NCBS, uh, just to understand what kind of issues postdocs have and provide a platform for them to uh, showcase their science. Uh, we invited faculty from all across India to this event to be judged, to judge their science and to kind of have an open talk that look, there are very few postdocs, uh, but we still don't know what kind of career opportunities they have. So there's a strong sense that uh, there's a uh, postdocs who are returning from a product favored over postdocs who have done science in India. Uh, so what, what can we do about it? Uh, and the one thing that we heard unanimously there was that the faculties had not realized that there was a growing postdoc population in India. Uh, and that kind of took us unawares because they were like, oh, now that we know that you're here, we'll, we'll try and address your problems. And we were like, that is crazy because we have been here for a while now. Um, and we always kept on saying that, look, we think that there is this perception that you're not hiring Indian um, postdocs, that, that, that you need to go outside uh, to get a postdoc to find a job back in India. And uh, the usual answer we got was, no, 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 that is not true. There is no recruitment bias, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So Megha and I thought, wait, hold on, we are scientists and we know what we need here. We need data. Uh, so we did a survey uh, of MSc, BSc and PhD students about what they felt, whether going outside was necessary, uh, whether um, there was a recruitment bias in Indian postdocs. And we overwhelmingly saw that majority believed that you had to go outside. Um, so, which was why we are creating this, we are training a lot of these PhD students mm -hmm. who are then going outside uh, to learn more, who are coming back as uh, faculty. But then when you come back as faculty, you also have to do all of the other admin and you've got all of these committees that you have to sit on, so you're not doing active lab work so much. Uh, of the active lab work, you're again training PhD students or are they going to go outside? So that trained workforce, which should be in India and contributing to Indian science, is, is something that we are missing. Uh, and so that's why we wrote this article to highlight the point that, look, if you want science to prosper in India, you need those trained people to actually come and do work. Uh, they can then do all part of their admin work, they can do training, they can do everything, but we are missing them somewhere. Uh, and I think as a follow-up to that, for the first time at the postdoc symposium last year, was the first time I heard someone admit that, okay, then, there's seemingly a recruitment bias at least. Uh, but because we could present data and we could say, hey, look, everybody thinks there's a recruitment bias. So, so that, that's where the article came from. Thanks for telling that, Shambhavi, and thanks for making the effort for the postdocs community there. And so I want to just uh, ask a follow up on that. that uh, what is, uh, do you think, being done to address this issue? You know, the challenges are there, you understand what are the issues, but then uh, on the scale of implementation, what do you think has been done to address it? So the DVD is coming up with uh, exciting new policies. Uh, there has been some attempt made to increase the duration of the postdoc itself as well. Uh, there has been some attempt made to create this new kind of scheme where a postdoc can then start becoming an independent researcher um, and have their own lab eventually. Uh, so we are seeing those things coming up. Uh, it will obviously take, a, say, take some time because there are a lot of mindsets which are involved in the recruitment process which will first need to change. We already know, for example, that a lot of the premier institutions prefer to hire people who are lower than 35 uh, to the faculty position um, and that it is, is extremely difficult for an Indian postdoc to actually uh, apply for because by the time you do your PhD and then you do your postdoc and you get papers, I mean, if you're going to wait for a year for your Sigma thing to turn up, then obviously you're not going to get a paper in two years. Uh, so, uh, and I'm not signaling your Sigma, so right? um, any reagent, right? It was going to take you nine. We, actually, in uh, one of my labs, we waited for nine months for HPLC grade water to come. 
so you really cannot answer uh, the viewers questions in three months if you're not going to get stuff for nine months so, um, Um, thank you for sharing with us your journey through academia. After the somewhat traditional uh, track, you ventured out to explore more, uh, explore the roads less traveled. Uh, you took a fellowship from Takshila on policy and then later became an independent entrepreneur. Did you always knew at your heart that, that you're going to do this after your PhD or it was just exploring the different options that was presented before you? Yeah, it was exploring different options. So I think till the last year of my postdoc, I had my head set that I wanted to have my own lab. Absolutely loved doing lab work. I really enjoyed being in the lab. Uh, so at no point of time had I actually thought about leaving wet lab research uh, and doing something else. It was only in the last year of my postdoc uh, that I felt that perhaps I should try doing something else. Um, and um, it was during this, uh, the, when we were trying to arrange for the, for the symposium, uh, when we were trying to reach out. So at NCBS, we, I, as I said, Apurva let me do a bunch of things. Uh, we taught, we started this course for uh, undergrad students from Bangalore University. They used to come eight Sundays in a row uh, and we used to teach them contemporary science articles or postdocs from, it's a voluntary thing for postdocs from NCBS. Um, so, and we took every, every uh, it was January, February, March and we used to pick a new topic every year. Uh, I really liked reaching out to people. Uh, and understanding their problems and you know, trying to figure out solutions. Um, and during that entire process, I thought of maybe I, I really like engaging people more uh, than engaging with the cells in the petri dish, uh, which was why I decided to move, uh, move away from wet lab research. Um, so in the last year, I started to figure out what I wanted to do. Like this policy bit really, really intrigued me uh, because I thought that uh, Indian scientists did not have enough voice uh, in the policy decisions that affect them themselves. That's how I moved to Takshashila. Uh, so I studied public policy with them with the idea to understand uh, how data can actually be used uh, to affect policy. Um, so, and it was my first step, I think, outside academic law, academic uh, arena. Uh, so it was like coming out of a bubble uh, and exploring something completely different. Um, meeting people outside was, it, it just felt very new. Uh, one of the things I think was because uh, you know, in my entire academic life, I was mostly in women-based labs, and the Trishila was like a 50-50 gender uh, balance. Uh, so it just felt like a completely different experience there itself. Um, but just understanding the, the policy theories, uh, understanding the way data interacts with society, uh, and not in not in a petri dish, but the, the impact that it has with society is so different. Uh, to do it. Um, so that's how I started with Takshishila. Uh, I still work with Takshishila. I'm, I'm a fellow there. Uh, so I work there two, day, two days a week, uh, mostly working on life science related policies. Um, and Cloudkit was because I just got immensely frustrated waiting for supplies. And I could see everybody around me was also like frustrated, but they did not know what to do. Uh, it has become kind of like an inherent part of life that we'll plan our experiments three months in advance. Uh, but it was just something that, was, that I was not okay with. But something that Apurva taught me over three years was that you demand that things are better. And Cloudkit for me was a way to demand that, that hey, look, this is a problem that I can, that can only be solved from the inside. We can't wait for some magic cure for the government to come and suddenly our supply chain for life science products is going to get better. Um, I had, uh, in my last year, I was managing four laboratories apart from doing science work. So it was something that I asked Apurva to give me uh, in a in trying to find out whether I wanted to run my own lab one day. Uh, because of that, uh, I had a good network of suppliers that had built up uh, because I was ordering on behalf of four different laboratories, a range of different products. Um, and I could understand their problems as well because of that. Uh, so I thought, okay, why don't we put our knowledge together uh, and try and find a solution. So I started CloudFit and Takshila more or less at the same time. Uh, and I still continue to do both of them. I still haven't figured out if I like one over the better. Thank you. That covered a lot of the questions we were planning to ask. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you briefly mentioned about um, what made you to decide to shift into a non-academic track. So how did you search for like, you know, as you said earlier as well, there is no like a centralized portal for this non-traditional careers. How did you come across Takshashila as an option? 
so takshi ji there was something that was known to a friend of mine ji megha who i mentioned about uh, who worked with me for the ghost of symposium she told me that there is this organization uh, that works uh, that does some public policy work uh, they have this uh, they have they have this three month courses online courses for working professionals to make you better citizens so to understand your your role uh, in society and your interaction with the government and she would suggest that I don't to do one of those uh, and i happened to mention to sunil lakshman who was one of my mentors uh, that who oh, i'm thinking about you know checking out this space called tashila and he said oh, i actually know somebody there uh, so he connected with somebody there then i went and visited them and that's how our interaction started uh, they were obviously not looking for a science policy like they haven't advertised it for a science policy course uh, but then i started um, uh, i did a course with them and i used to attend a few meetings at public meetings that they had Uh, and uh, we had one on gene editing regulation. Uh, someone uh, from the US had come and uh, spoke about how there should be a moratorium on gene editing, um, and that's how I got roped in uh, because then they we thought that we should write something about gene editing regulation in India, and from then on I started working with them. Thank you. And, uh, I did actually. Uh, I wanted to uh, also make another point about why I left academia um, because. I think a lot of people leave academia out of anger, out of the feeling that uh, it's not working for them. I left academia because I just do not like the, the paper writing process, the publication process. Um, because I did not have any papers in my PhD, I think I was still quite enthu about doing a postdoc and still enthu about working in a lab, uh, having my own lab. But the minute I wrote my first paper and it got published, you know, you are supposed to enjoy, right? You are supposed to be like really happy that your first paper is out. I did not feel that. uh i really hated this whole oh this plot has to be perfect and you know that needs to be cropped by an inch and i could not see myself going through life doing that uh and th- that's where that decided i was going to leave academia because you have, you need to enjoy doing that if you want to stay in academia you really, you really need to do so it was a very practical decision for me because i still love the lab i it, now is the only time that i think i have been doing an experiment Uh, because i feel that with the covid 19 situation i could actually go help someone say the pcs uh, but apart from that i am not really um miss doing experiments as such but i have missed the lab i have missed the feeling of of being of doing science uh, but yeah i could not see myself doing publication from that that's the dirty part of <laughs> the science uh-huh. Yeah, so, so it's you, a necessary part, and you have to like it. I mean, you really have to like it. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. it can be quite frustrating as well. Yeah, like, you know, you finish your pro, you do an experiment which takes you like a year, uh, year, two years to finish, and then you again have to spend one year just editing your yeah. manuscripts and different. Yeah, it can be quite frustrating. Um, you briefly mentioned about uh, uh, how you the how you got the idea of starting Cloud Grade and what mm-hmm. motivated you to do that. So, can you give us a brief uh, a description of how you started with that idea and how you implemented it? How do you elaborate on that? Uh, how do you go about from the idea right. stage to the execution yeah. stage? Right. So, um, again, I have to thank Sunil for uh, for CloudKid as well. Uh, so, when Sunil came, um, I was uh, I helped him set up his lab, um, and he brought with him uh, Podzi, uh, which is a, a, an inventory management program used widely in the US. Uh, and it was the first time that I was in an inventory management program, um, and as I helped him set it up, I could see that there were nuances out of policy that could be used in the Indian setup as well. Um, and then over time, um, I worked with my husband Pushpa. So Pushpa is a supply chain expert. He has worked with Big Pharma uh, on uh, streamlining their supply chains. And obviously, Indian academia cannot afford solutions which are made for Big Pharma. But we thought, why don't we tailor something that comes from my knowledge of being in the lab uh, of the experience that Percy has had in the years uh, and of what Pushkar has seen in big pharma uh, and come up with a solution that might work in the indian context uh, so that's how the idea developed uh, it took me about 6 months uh, to figure out whether i actually wanted to leave wet lab research and do this uh, so it, it wasn't an overnight decision uh, and in that time i i spoke with a lot of researchers uh, within ncbs and in the postdoc community across india on what kind of solution might actually work uh, i spoke with a lot of suppliers who actually came uh, forth and said oh we want to help uh, streamline this as well 
because it's a big headache for us as school. Um, so that's how the idea grew. Uh, but at no point of time did I feel competent enough to actually implement this. Uh, it, well, it took us a while to kind of get going. Um, we obviously also had to set aside some savings to put into this. Um, uh, it took us about another eight months uh, to actually come up with something that was workable. By this time, uh, NSR Cell, which is the entrepreneurial wing here at IM Bangalore, uh, put out a call for women startups. Uh, so Goldman Sachs was funding this program for women startups for a year, where you get a stipend and you get mentoring from uh, NSRSL experts. Um, we enrolled into that. There was a three-month competition, uh, at the end of which we got selected in the top 15 startups. Uh, so got incubated there, which was extremely helpful in giving confidence and the expertise that you need to do like marketing, uh, come up with a business plan and things like that, that no PhD will ever teach you. Uh, so uh, that actually helped us get on the road uh, and expand from the from having no customers to our first 10 customers. Uh, so we were in that program for a year, uh, after which we got a bit of funding from NS Raghun uh, to now expand it. And um, last year we got funding from the government of Karnataka uh, for our new program, which is, uh, so at this point of time we were gathering data on how to improve the supply chain. Uh, now we are going to have our own freezers, like vending machines, uh, with uh, life science supplies in institutions. Uh, so that whenever a lab needs, say, like a DNA tag polymerase, they can just go to the fridge and get it. Uh, so, Government of Karnataka is supporting us putting out that program, which basically takes down the supply chain down to zero. It has taken us three years of ideation to reach this stage. Uh, and many, many experts, and I have to thank, I really thank a lot of the scientists who took, up, took out their time to talk to us uh, and define the program. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that basically talking is the most important part of going from idea to implementation. Always talk to your customer because you always feel in your head that you know best, but really it is there. Um, kudos to you to start this unique uh, you know, opportunity back in India. Um, so just to follow up on that, uh, you did mention a bit about uh, the market research you had to do and uh, the networking you had to do. So for the, for um, like a startup, for a startup or these entrepreneur ideas, are there any different components like uh, that you have to keep in mind for such market research or networking? Like who do you reach out to and how do you find them? Yeah, I think the most important part that I am taught us very early on was to target the correct customer segment. Um, so, for example, for CloudFit, when we started, we were saying, oh, uh, any any uh, laboratory that requires research products, right? Because anyone that, say, suppose requires any molecular biology reagent is our time. Uh, even during over time, we started realizing that people are not going to buy from a marketplace uh, if you are a government-funded lab because government funds do not allow online purchase. Uh, so then we had to narrow it down and say, no, no, no. So for these guys, we have to do something else. Uh, the private labs can still buy from us. Uh, then we figured that anyone who has a central procurement system uh, does not require anybody from outside to bring them clothes. Uh, so then we had to streamline again. So stratifying your customer is something and, and really trying to build a persona of the guy who is going to be the end user is, is extremely important. Um, this was obviously something that I never learned as when I was staring down the microscope and looking at cells in the petri dish. Uh, so um, that was the first thing that was very important to learn. The second is the motivation of the customer. Right? So we thought that we are building this amazing marketplace, uh, like an Amazon for life science research uh, products, and we're like, ah, everybody would want to come and buy, and who would not? Uh, but nobody did. Uh, and it took us a while to figure out that took scientists already are very busy to ask them now to go and like, hey, look, we have got this amazing new tag. It's not something that they are really interested in. If you go and tell them that, look, hey, this is a new tag, this is going to save you money and this is actually works as good as what something you have. Yes. But if you ask them to find the time to go and Google it and search it on your search engine, then it's a little difficult. Uh, so understanding that kind of customer behavior was the second important learning lesson for us. Um, and then this, you always look at these things from your own perspective. I thought, huh, I would love to go and like look up what's new on the market, but really people don't have the time. Just, right. um, 
so those two things actually the first, the first two things that we learned uh, at NSNSF. Right. Um, and what about the um, legality of starting a new um, company or a platform, let's say? Like, how did you navigate through that process? Oh, that is actually fairly simply tied now in India. Uh, so our first uh, first legal entity was uh, we did a uh, LLP, uh, and then uh, because we got the funding from government of Karnataka, we had to do a private limited. Uh, but both of those got done fairly simply. We just need a CA, uh, and yeah, it took like two or three days, so not a lot of time. Okay. So. And then, uh, do you think the geographical location helped you a bit? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so of course it did. Uh, I mean, finding uh, software developers was obviously easy. Right. But the, just the ecosystem is so primed uh, to encourage startups. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, you look at like big names and you think that, oh, I mean, these guys are never going to help us out, right? They're not going to mentor us. Uh, but literally, a lot of people stood up uh, and have agreed to help. Uh, help us get started. Um, so when we are thinking about this pitch program, for example, uh, we wrote uh, on LinkedIn to this uh, guy who has so here in uh, India, Big Basket, uh, which is like an Amazon grocery esque thing, uh, but an individual company. Uh, they have started with this vending machines, uh, which they have put in apartment complexes, uh, which where you have um, eggs and milk and stuff that they keep, and you can just go and pick stuff up. So we thought, oh, maybe we can write whoever has made these uh, and see if they can help us with our own uh, rich visa program. And so we wrote to them on LinkedIn, not really expecting a reply, but the guy called me up in 24 hours and was like, let me know, how can I help you? What, what kind of questions do you have? Uh, and so it is really encouraging uh, in that sense. Um, there's a lot of funding available uh, also uh, in the biotech sector as well, because obviously in Bangalore, we have CCAM, we have BBC, uh, and both of those incubators have also been quite encouraging to us. So uh, hopefully we're going to start with our face the program in both of those locations. Uh, so just the kind of expertise that is available, really, uh, is, is very great. And government of Karnataka is extremely encouraging of the startups. Uh, so for example, they have given us a bit of funding uh, for the space visa program. Um, and they are continuously hand-holding us and helping us uh, connect with people who can help scale this program as well. You briefly mentioned about some of the challenges that you faced during this process. So can you tell us what was the most challenging of that and how did you tackle that problem? The most challenging for me personally was not having a boss. Um, <laughs> it was really difficult uh, not, <laughs> sorry, uh, it was very difficult to get into the rhythm of where you don't have to report to somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for the first six months, it was like, huh, I'll do this tomorrow, huh, it's still happen. Which is definitely not the entrepreneurial spirit, right? When the entrepreneurial spirit is like, no, no, it has to be get done immediately. So that took a bit of time to build up. Uh, again, the NSRC program really helped because we had to go there on Tuesdays uh, and uh, say what we had done in the week. So at least then on Monday, we were doing something uh, to be able to report on Tuesday. Uh, but that got us into a rhythm. Uh, and then I started setting that no, I'm going to do weekly goals for myself and if I don't achieve them, then there's some, there has to be some punishment at the end uh, or there has to be a reward at the end. So that getting motivated to be answerable to yourself uh, was my biggest challenge uh, and food as an incentive worked really well. <laughs> Thank you for that insight. It would be really helpful for us during the COVID times and work from home situation. <laughs> um, so uh, how do you think uh, CloudCrate will impact the research ecosystem in India? Oh, my, I mean, my dream would be that there is no researcher in India who has to wait for their lab supplies to come. There is no one who wants to do a risk-taking experiment and cannot do it because hey the product is stuck in germany uh, that would be my my dream that people feel that they can do any experiment that they want to that uh, whatever the order will come in a couple of days uh, that they never feel restricted by the kind of things that they, that is available to them uh, so this is on the lab front um on the local manufacturer front uh, so a lot of our products continue to come from outside india uh, 
and it is not because they are not made in India. It is just that the local alternatives are not uh, have not got that much exposure as it should have, uh, and these concerns over their reliability. I want to change that. I want I want every institute in any of my fridges to have at least some of these locally made manufactured uh, manufactured products, uh, so that people try them and see that they work. Um, and use them instead because then they are cheaper, they will come quicker, uh, it is great for the Indian economy, it is great for the Indian manufacturers and there's absolutely no reason why we should be importing all of these things when we are good enough to make them all. So that, those two impacts, if I, at least 10% of those two impacts if I'm able to have, I'd be very, very happy. So that was nice, uh, Shambhavi. Uh, just a follow up to that. So I understand that, that this is still like developing at a developing pace, right? So what do you think uh, you will have like other features or like the greatest impacts once the platform is like fully developed? I am uh, hoping that this Fridge Pro Pizza program that we are starting out with, hopefully once this lockdown is over, uh, will have the biggest impact because obviously the supply chain for those products for the lab is zero. They can just walk up to the fridge and get anything that they want. Um, we are also trying to develop better inventory management solutions um, than the one that we currently have. Um, we are getting a lot of insights from scientists themselves on how to make that better. Um, so hopefully uh, soon we will have this integrated thing where you know where what is in your lab, what is in a cloud kit in fridge, uh, what you need to order when. Uh, so our basic idea is to deliver on that intelligence to the lab, uh, so that you do not waste your thinking space trying to figure out the supplies that you need to do an experiment. Um, so uh, what are what skills and trainings that you acquired during your bench work, uh, doing actual science, uh, helped you? Uh, in your entrepreneurial journey? So, two main sets of skills. Uh, one is the analytical skills, obviously. Um, I, I thought it was very important uh, to be able to get data and to be able to analyze data, to be able to analyze customer behavior. Um, and a lot of that analytical skills came from my PhD, it just came from observing things, right? Um, and being able to question uh, a data set and say, hey, where's the control for that? Uh, so, the analytics skill was obviously very important. Uh, the other is obviously a deep knowledge of the of the products itself. Uh, so, if if somebody calls me up and says that hey, I need a um, a tack polymerase from this company, uh, but I need it in two days, I can tell them that we don't have, we can't get you this company's tack polymerase in two days. But I know the experiment you're doing, I know this will work instead, and this we can get to the market. And we've actually been able to do that. We were able to uh, give products uh, within a couple of hours to somebody because just because we knew an equivalent product uh, was was available. Uh, so that obviously plays a big role in the decision making of what product to recommend. Okay, so supply chain management is like very different from cancer biology, right? So <laughs> how did you manage this transition and the knowledge gap associated with this? I have actually never looked at it that way. Uh, when it, when you sent me that question as well, I thought about it and I was like, well, I have never been, I never felt like, oh, I'm doing something different. I think because it just ebbed and flowed that way, uh, because I was doing cancer biology in a lab where I could see that there were supply chain issues. And then I found a significant point of my, uh, a significant portion of my time was spent on the supply chain issues than on cancer biology. Uh, I kind of swerved in that way anyways. Um, so, uh, yeah, and it just felt amazing to learn of this new problem uh, and try and solve it. So I, I actually never thought about it that, okay, this is something we completely unrelated to what I've learned so far. That that never dawned on me, actually. I just looked at it as an opportunity to learn something new and, yeah, took it head on that way. Okay. It's inspiring to learn that how you are taking like the flow, right? Taking the options which is coming in front of you and the opportunities and making the best use of it. So with that, my next question is that I know you are very good at networking, but then how different you felt was business networking than scientific networking? 
so in scientific networking i have been very lucky to have had some really good collaborators uh people who have been very open with uh, their ideas and their labs um uh, i started in the uk i was at a conference and i met this guy from Man from the university of manchester who had come to see my poster and he was like oh you know we do some experiments why don't you come to my lab and do and we can collaborate and do some experiments together um and i was like okay um i have been very lucky with the people that i've met uh from then on and i think it has continued with the business um both in business and policy uh careers as well uh there is very little secrecy i mean at at a very young career uh, level there's very little secrecy people are extremely open uh, the iim program for example we had a three week residency program within iimb for 50 women and it was the most fantastic time i've had in my life uh, because people were so open about what they wanted to do the ideas that they wanted to share um funding issues that they had um and that group actually continues to exist on whatsapp where we still talk about um uh, today we lost a big deal or today something great happened to us um uh, whatever uh, and that as a little to share as um has been great there obviously uh, been a few people who have not been that nice uh, but that's something you learn on the way um again mentoring is very important uh, mentors can help you uh, gauge motivations of people especially of investors who might reach out to you uh so i don't and not find there to be a lot of difference between networking for science collaboration or networking for a business collaboration yeah i think it helped me in this <laughs> uh what kind of resources are available in india for like future entrepreneurs including like faculty who want to do both like but both be part of an entrepreneur and still continue to have a research lab uh like what all facilities are available like if you have a novel idea what resources can you use to explore that idea so a lot of uh, a lot of the premier institutes have their own incubators as well so not their incubators on their campuses uh, where faculty can actually also participate and explore ideas of uh, entrepreneurial nature there are some regulations around how much you can do and what kind of uh, salary you can take and stuff like that um but there are opportunities where you can actually at least explore the idea to begin with um dbt also has a lot of these incubators across the country there are a lot of biotech parks as well um so starting up per se uh, is not that difficult till the state of ideation uh, there's a lot of funding available uh, so there's a big grant which is 50 lakh rupees for, for any idea that that goes through there are very rigorous process um then individual governments have their own grants um there are a lot of philanthropic grants that are available a lot of these um grant challenges that uh, are uh, announced by governments again where there's a tip, like the problem of uh, sanitation for example uh, or purifying water so they will come up with a grant challenge around those specific areas and then you can apply uh, so funding is not really that much uh, that is a problem initially um where i think india's main problem comes in is manufacturing to a bigger scale um, and to be able to get sustained funding after some time uh, particularly in the biotech sector because private funding is less uh, we don't see that much of venture venture capital is coming in the private sector Co currently it's mostly government uh, so the initial ideation part i think is extremely well supported uh, but hopefully um, now that there is a rejuvenated interest in the life sciences um, we will see more funding coming to sustain a longer life cycle for the, for the biotech sector um you have a, a multifaceted career along with uh, which includes like a policy fellowship and entrepreneurial effects and along with that you have also dabbled in science communication as well how has been your experience as a science communicator writing blogs and like recording podcasts so that i thought i was sort of a part of my job uh i i never actually gave so much uh, attention to science communication when i was actually a wet lab researcher uh, a lot of this came uh, once i moved away from uh, from wet lab research because i think that's when i started actually interacting with people outside of science and understanding what kind of requirements they actually have uh, which is why um, a lot of the science communication uh, writing blogs i started working i volunteered with this organization known as the agastya international foundation 
uh, where they create uh, science games uh, to explain scientific concepts. So I've made a couple of board games uh, there. We are currently building uh, this, uh, we're currently building a playground, uh, which is like a human cell, uh, which has a nucleus um, and DNA, like a gigantic 3D DNA in it, uh, mitochondria, and everything made to scale um, in a 100 by 60 feet playground. And the idea is that the children will play out molecular processes as games. Uh, so the first one that I have designed is when they when they are when they are the DNA, then they become the RNA, and then they have to go. They have given cycles as amino acids, and they have to go and dock somewhere and be a polypeptide chain. Uh, the idea is not to teach them, obviously. The idea is for them to have fun and remember uh, that they played out this process, so that eventually one day, uh, when they learn about uh, the central dogma, they can relate back and say, "Hey, I remember this. Uh, I remember being inside the nucleus." which is like a dome in the playground. Uh, the idea is that uh, even uh, when I was doing my PhD, uh, I always imagined the cell to be 2D because we've always seen is a 2D in books uh, and the idea that it is 3D and then things can move up and down as well. This feels novel even at the PhD level. Uh, so we wanted to give the children the idea that no, the cell is always going to be 3D uh, and you can experience being inside it. Uh, so, uh, I have to say thanks to Augusta for letting me create this uh, really uh, novel thing and for funding it, funding its growth and making sure that it exceeds the day of life. Uh, uh, and yeah, letting me try to test my crazy ideas on their kids. Uh, they, they, they take government school children from across uh, uh, who uh, come and spend a day there. So, um, yeah, it was, you know, it, it is again very satisfying to be able to communicate what you understand uh, in a language that people want to hear it in. I think sometimes we just we just feel that talking to lay people, it means that we need to dumb out the science. But that's not true. I think we just need to talk to them in a language that they understand in the examples that they understand. So that, yeah, that's when I started with uh, uh, with adding blogs first. I now have them. Uh, I now have my own podcast, which is known as Lab Coach Podcast. Um, I've just had one episode out um, with the idea that I want to explore is why India should have more research and development, why should India fund more research and development. Um, and I'm taking on some science questions and trying to answer what's been done in India. So, I like I really wish now that I was growing up in this time. You know, it's so exciting to learn science. <laughs> Um, just to follow up on that, um, how easy or difficult it is to gather this content? Like, like you have to, um, in the back of your mind, you're thinking like you have to uh, connect with the lay, lay audience, right? So how, how do you approach that? But I've been, again, very lucky because all the three jobs that I do, um, uh, through Cloud Faith, through uh, my policy work, as well as any science communication work I've done so far, so attending conferences, for example, um, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of people uh, and hear the perspective of a lot of people on, say, the same topic. So I usually bug, um, if I'm writing an open, for example, now I'm writing one on the, the idea of pool testing for COVID. Um, I know people uh, who are scientists who, who do the RT PCR and nations. Um, I know uh, journalists and I'll ask the same questions to all of them and get their perspectives uh, and then try to uh, gauge the writing of my op-ed so that it, it basically in, takes in all the expert points uh, but is easily understandable for everybody. Uh, so because I can hear a lot of perspectives uh, because of the three goals I do, I end up enriching myself with all of those perspectives as well. Uh, and then it makes me think of an opinion for myself which is that much more um, insightful than me just reading an article and thinking how okay, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the best way of getting content is again talking to people. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, you mentioned that you have started your own podcast. Um, so how are you planning to reach out to the audience? Planning or outreach? Yeah, it is, so this is footsteps heavy for steps for a podcast. Um, it's more like a hobby podcast than an actual good, like amazing quality uh, podcast. So I, I one episode out uh, two weeks ago on the coronavirus crisis. Um, 
uh, the idea is to get interesting perspective. So I had one scientist at Chitra Patabiraman, who's a viro molecular virologist. Uh, and then I had someone who says China uh, to talk about the Chinese response. So it was not just like all science, it was policy as well as science. Um, this time I had someone, uh, we spoke about uh, India ex uh, exploring their healthcare opportunity in Africa, why we are not actually looked at Africa as a market so far. And I, I had a physician who has worked in Africa um, and a lawyer who has worked with CIPLA, which obviously has made the HIV drugs which are quite popular on the African continent. Uh, so the idea is to get those kind of mixed voices uh, onto a podcast and talk about things. Um, in terms of outreach, I am just currently using whatever limited outreach I have and that I has. I want to see how this goes, how this goes. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things about any new idea that you have that I've done with Tatsushila, with, with the outfit and now with the podcast is, is to try it out first uh, in a small scale. Uh, I think one of, one of the biggest learnings from the outfit was that we always try to get the perfect thing out. It's like our thesis, right? It, we feel that we have to get the perfect version out, otherwise it, it's not done. Uh, and at, at the end of writing my thesis, I realized it has to be abandoned at some point of time. It, it is never going to be perfect. And I think we, we always have this idea that, okay, if I want to put something out in the public, it has to be perfect, but it really doesn't. Send it out. People will give you good feedback. There are a lot of good people out there. Uh, once you get that good feedback, build on that feedback. Uh, be open-minded to that criticism. Um, then you go along with your people. Because then they like something, then they'll be like, huh, okay, have you heard this? Um, they will send it to a few more people. So I started this newsletter as well. Um, it's a fortnightly newsletter working, looking at science policies uh, across the world. Um, I started with um, five people from office uh, and I wrote to a lot of my contacts and said, hey, do you want to subscribe to this? Um, I currently have about 160 subscribers, but all of them grown organically because people have given feedback and I've um, it has been incorporated and they've sent it out to other people. So it's easier to grow like that than to grow COVID style, don't grow exponentially. Grow slowly, take your time. Uh, there is a lot of time to grow. Uh, so, yeah. But make sure that you're always, that whenever you go, you are incorporating things that you're learning at the same time. Right. That we can very young. Well, uh, wow, Shambhavi, it was like, it has been really inspirational. And such a pleasure to listen to how you navigate, navigated through your career path. And last but definitely not the least, we would like your advice for our listeners who are currently early career scientists in the US and are ready to transition to a non-traditional career in India. So my question is, uh, what is your advice for the postdocs or graduate students that are aspiring to transition from bench work to non-traditional careers in academia? Okay. So one piece of advice I gave to everybody was an advice I got from Apurva um, is on when to time your leaving. Uh, so um, I don't think my mother knows this. Um, there was a time when I was ready to quit Apurva's lab uh, and I mean, leave science and I was like very frustrated. It was on the day when my paper had got rejected and my grant application had not gone through. And I was like, I went to Apurva and I told her, this is not happening, I'm going to leave. Uh, and she sat me down and she was like, look, if you want to leave and do something else, I respect that. Uh, but not today. Not when you do not realize what you can contribute to the field. Uh, not when you feel as if you have, not on the day when you feel like a complete loser. We will get the paper out. We will get the ground out. Uh, if you still feel you want to leave, then you can. Um, and we worked over the next year and a half, got the paper out, got the ground. Uh, and then I told her that, look, I still feel as if I won't do something else. And she was like, okay, now you understand. Now you're in a happy place. You know what being in the lab means for you. You still want to go do something else? Sure. Uh, and I want to tell everybody that please be in that mindset if you want to choose doing something non-traditional. Um, be absolutely sure that you're happy with it. Um, so there's one piece of advice. The other is what, how to actually get started with, uh, with looking for uh, non-traditional. Pick your interest first. Okay, this is the way I went about it. I liked science communication. I reached out to a I liked policy. I reached out to the Shira. 
it never came the other way around it was never looking for jobs uh, and then figuring out what i would like to do so in india you will not find that kind of job categorization currently uh, so try and figure out what really interests you there are a lot of opportunities it's completely untapped space in india so you can just imagine what kind of positions you can carve out for yourself um for example think of the policy book right there are very few people who have done their phd's in life sciences and moved on to then study public policy uh in about a couple of years since finishing my public policy training i have represented india um at the disarmament conference in germany uh that uh, the german council here actually nominated me for uh, i have been i represented india at the brics academic forum last year in brazil uh on science cooperation and uh, as much as i was supposed to come to us uh, next month as part of the indo us pacific dialogue um i have been invited by the rajya sabha committee on science and tech to discuss the dna technology bill uh, and you can think that like, there are so many scientists in india but i have been able to engage with that because i have on uh, have chosen a completely different route of approaching policy so there are amazing opportunities if you try uh it is risky it is going to be a gamble uh but it is completely uncharted territory which just means that all the opportunities for it are for you to create and grab uh there's a lot of positivity there are a lot of people who are very happy uh to hear from you uh, to get you on board uh and i i think it really helps us appreciate ourselves as well because you know in a phd in a lab where everyone is a phd you don't feel special uh when you go to a place where nobody else has a phd you do feel special you do understand your work you do understand what you bring that the difference in the training the analytic training that we have it will come through nice that were really good advices so uh what and also if you want to reach out to me i'm also happy with, with <laughs> that i can always do for sure i i <laughs> so no, for anybody please feel free to reach out to me Okay, so what do you think are the soft skills uh, people should inculcate during their PhD or postdoc era that would be very important for having a career in Indian science? In Indian science, mm -hmm. I think again I'm going to say networking. I don't think there is any other equitable soft skill, um, and I would say don't just stick to your own area of expertise. Can you network with people? Yeah, so suppose if you're from cancer biology. Don't say I'm going to only go and talk to cancer biologists, right? Because as I said, on Indian campuses, if you you have to talk to other people as well. Uh, so try and network as much as you can. Uh, hopefully, you will fix the supply chain problem by the time you guys get here. Uh, so that shouldn't be such a big issue. Um, but yeah, I think I'll, I'll say networking. Okay. Okay. so also like people who are abroad sometimes like miss some of the resources which would be important for careers in india so what do you think are some fundamental resources for careers in india that people abroad sh should keep an eye on like websites or personal connections as you mentioned right. so um india bioscience is a really good repository of uh, opportunities in india uh, nature india also maintains quite a good blog but from what i have understood the way uh, indian science work is best to be able to connect with the pi directly um, or with the institution directly um, so always write uh, from the, the way i have seen things happen here is that you write you go give a talk you offer on your next vacation home that hey i can come give a talk about the amazing work that i have been doing um, not looking for a faculty position yet but i just want to come and see it also gives you the opportunity Uh, to go and explore the place because a lot of the institutions looks great on paper, uh, but you really want to go there and talk to the PhD students, the postdocs there, uh, to understand the inner workings uh, of any institution. Right, uh, so that's always a great start, and, and a lot of institutions are happy uh, to get people from outside India to come and talk to their students. So do try that, uh, yeah, and keep a look at these websites as well. But it is best that. You are on their radar before before they are actively searching for something. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Then, uh, is there anything different in non-traditional careers that bench scientists might tend to overlook? Uh, 
I think we overlook the um, the value that we bring to non-traditional careers. We feel we are not trained for those careers, um, and therefore we are very circumspect about what we do in them, and which is completely wrong thinking. Um, I think a PhD trains you to do more jobs um, that require analytical thinking. Obviously, you need to learn some of the ropes when you when you go when you do something new, uh, but you're basically prepared for that. Uh, so always make sure that you know your own value. Uh, when you are looking for a non-traditional career, um, yeah, and there's no, there's nothing that I don't miss the fact that I don't do Western blotting anymore. Right, uh, so th that was never the value that my PhD taught me. Uh, it was to take the data and configure the data. Uh, so make sure that you know what your value is. Is it the question? Is that the answer you're looking for? Did I misunderstand the question? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, that was that was cool. Uh, also, do you think that India has lower visibility and scope for uh, non-traditional careers like science communication, policy, research, administration, etc.? And if so, how can it be improved? I think India is still waking up to its postdocs. Right? We're still waking up to the fact that we have postdocs who can do science. Uh, so the idea that they can also do other stuff is still quite new. Uh, there is a lot of, there's a movement going on right now for science communication. Uh, it started in the pre-COVID days, but I assume with the coronavirus, we will see a stronger effort being made to push science uh, communication. Um, pay continues to be a problem, right? So pay for science and non-science jobs for scientists are both pay low. Uh, so that will always remain a problem unless there's a massive increase in funding um, but i don't think we have i don't i think there's still a behavior change required from at least a certain section of the senior scientists that doing that doing that using your phd training to do something else is okay and acceptable uh, they still looked at an alternative career which is not and they're all alternates right so as a phd i think as a phd is is, is still a training and at the end of the phd or at the end of the postdoc you can still determine which route you can take. And one of those routes is staying in, is going wet lab research. Uh, doesn't mean that you are wedded to doing wet lab research. That kind of change, attitude change is, is yet to come in. But I think as, a, as we grow, as more new scientists come into the world, we'll start seeing that change. Okay. And what do you think is the silver lining of going back to India? That's a silver cloud. Yeah. Uh, personally, for me, it has been great, uh, both on the professional and on the family front. Uh, front. Obviously, uh, my parents are here, so um, I get to see them more often. But professionally, as I said, I don't think I would have ever been able to do this cloud trade and policy business uh, if I was in the UK, because those things are set there. And there are no challenges, right? People know what they want to do. You have enough precedence for someone who wants to go into regulatory affairs after doing a PhD. All of these things are not here in India. There are amazing opportunities for you to carve out your own path. There is no, there's nothing set in stone that, hey, um, if I wanted to do policy, I have to go to Tachishila and I have to go and do something like this, right? I can basically choose what I want to do um, and take the risk and be happy because I, I can, I've never felt that hard is the path that I have to follow now. Um, and then there are so many issues to tackle uh, that you always feel that, you know, we can do more. It, it is not a land of challenges, it is a land of opportunities, according to me. On the NCBS campus, for example, like I said, we started with this um, BSc student uh, course. And that's because NCBS allowed us to do it. Uh, and we felt that the BSc students did not have enough exposure. Uh, at Bangalore University to be able to come and look at labs. And kudos to them, they came eight continuous Sundays. I mean, that's Monday to Saturday of college work and then Sundays going to NCBS, which is pretty far, uh, and studying there. Uh, so I don't think anybody this could have worked in the UK, right? So it's, it's a lot of opportunities. Uh, so I'm pretty happy with my decision. That's great, Shambhavi. And... Um, Thanks a lot again. This concludes our interview for today. 
Thank you for joining and sharing your experience with us. And we wish you all the best for your new adventures and we hope you achieve all the success you deserve. And now to our listeners, uh, a big thank you for tuning in. We hope this interview has provided you with some new information to aid you in your transition process. And please visit www.sciroi.net slash blogs for your to Shambhavi. Have a great day and stay safe, everyone. Thanks again, Shambhavi. Thank you guys for having me.